All right, so welcome back, everyone. Our next speaker for this afternoon is Anne Mosier. She is a wildlife staff biologist with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. She currently coordinates the sage grouse program and has been working on sage grouse conservation and biology since 2007. She has a master's in wildlife resources from the United, United University of Idaho. And Thank you, and thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you for having me this afternoon, um, and thank you for, for hanging on uh, towards the end of the day here. Oops, we already learned we weren't supposed to move this thing. Okay, so we've had lots of talks today um, about partnerships and collaborations and cooperation, um, and this is going to be along that same theme. Um, but before I get started, um, I'm going to talk about sage grouse ecology, and that'll kind of, kind of set the stage about why we need to think about restoration for sage grouse um, on a bigger scale than what we normally think about for restoration for a particular species. So sage grouse 101, we're at a university, so we can do sage grouse 101. So the first thing you need to know about sage grouse, sage grouse need sagebrush. Okay, that's why they're called sage grouse. So sage grouse need sagebrush. Um, they use it for protective cover, protection from predators. They put their nests underneath sagebrush. But most importantly, they exclusively eat the leaves of sagebrush in the winter. So it's a very unique characteristic among any wildlife species. Um, and that's why they need sagebrush. Um, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to go back. Okay, sage grouse are a long-lived species. So sage grouse are an upland game bird species, similar to quail or partridge. They're in that same family. But most of those upland game bird species that we're used to um, talking about are very short-lived. They only live for a few years. Sage grouse, on the other hand, are a long-lived species, and they can live several years, if not up to a decade. They also have a low reproductive potential compared to other game bird species. So again, when we think of something like a, a quail, if you've ever seen a quail nest, there can be 15 or 20 eggs in a quail nest. So they have the potential to really respond quickly to good environmental conditions. If all those eggs hatch successfully, there's good conditions to raid those chicks, there's going to be a bunch of quail on the landscape. Sage grouse, on the other hand, only lay about eight eggs a year. So they don't have that ability to respond quickly to changing environmental conditions. Sage grouse have high overwinter survival. And this is, in, this is unique really among any wildlife species um, in North America, in the West. So winter is usually a time of you know, scarcity, right? There's very few resources. There's very little food. It's very cold. Sage grouse, on the other hand, thrive in winter because they eat sagebrush leaves. So as long as they can find sagebrush available above the snow, they are going to thrive. Um, their survival rates are actually near 100% in the wintertime. Um, obviously, there are some sage grouse that will die to predation um, by a coyote or a golden eagle over the winter. But as far as food, they're, they're fat in, over winter. They're also very well insulated. So that's another reason why they can survive winter very well. Sage grouse have high site fidelity. And when you hear that term, that sounds like a great term, um, until you think about all the disturbances um, occurring on the landscape, that sage grouse do not have the ability to respond to those disturbances, at least in a quick manner. So for example, a wildfire comes through a breeding area, burns the, um, the lax, burns the nesting habitat. Those birds, they don't have the ability to adapt. Basically, the males will still go back to the lax, they'll still do their, their displays, They'll still try to attack females. Um, they're going to have high predation rates because the sagebrush cover is gone. Hens aren't going to have any place to put their nests anymore. So that population gradually declines because those birds can't do anything else but keep coming back to the same places. Sage grouse are also what we call a landscape level species. And that basically means that they have large movements or they can have large movements among seasonal ranges. So they can move from a breeding area to um, a summer area, to a winter area, and there can be many miles in between those areas. Um, and again, that's very different from what we think about if you think about something like a quail or a partridge or a pheasant, that pheasant basically lives in one um, field for his whole life. Sage grouse are making these big, large movements. 
So I said sage grouse needs sage brush, and this is just a couple of pictures of, that sage brush can look different. So we have the three basic sage brush species or subspecies, um, Wyoming big sage brush, basin big sage brush, and mountain big sage brush. Um, sage grouse also use the dwarf sage brush species, and that's uh, low sage, um, Artemisia arbuscula, and black sage, Artemisia nova. Those are used, um, they're often used on winter range actually, because you can see in this picture down here, this rocky picture, this would be a windswept ridge in the winter um, where the snow would come off very quickly and the birds are able to access um, that, that low sagebrush cover. Um, other sagebrush species that sage grouse use, the three-tip sage, um, we have it in Idaho. I don't know if it's here in Utah or not. Um, and then silver sage is a, a different sagebrush species that's used mostly in eastern Montana. So as I said, sage grouse are a landscape level species. So this is a picture that I took in Hawaii County, which is in southwest Idaho, and I'm practically on the border of Nevada and looking out almost to the Snake River Plain. Um, and this can actually be the whole home range of a sage grouse population. So they might breed way down um, the lower elevation. Um, that might be their nesting area, their lacking area. They might come to this. Is there a pointer on here? Yes. This right here, riparian area, this wet meadow, is a place that a sage grouse hen might want to take her broods. So she might move many miles to get to this late brood ring habitat. And then in the winter, maybe they spend the winter on this windswept ridge up here. So this could be, this is almost what you would think of, this is a landscape that a mule deer would use. That's how large the landscape is. So just a couple of pictures. We can understand um, what the leks look like. So these are sage grouse on leks. Um, this one, you can see they're kind of out here in this patch of low sage where they can see each other and do their silly displays and everybody can see them. Um, just to give you a picture of what sage grouse leks look like. Nests, as I said, are usually under a sage brush. And here you can see one here. But when a hen decides to nest somewhere, not only is she looking for a good nesting cover, so to protect that nest, um, but she's also looking for a good place to take her chicks right after they hatch. So, they will, so there is a nest in this patch of sagebrush right here, and she has some good stuff right out here that's immediately going to provide insects and forbs for those chicks when they hatch. So sage grouse live in the desert. Those of you that live in the sagebrush landscape, you know that the sagebrush um, dries out very quickly. The sagebrush landscape dries out very quickly. The forbs are only, and the flowers are only available for a few months before they dry up. So sage grouse chicks are going to be eating insects and forbs throughout the summer. And when that vegetation dries up, the hen needs to take her brood somewhere where she can still get that green vegetation. So often they'll move up in elevation, so that way they get greener vegetation. Or they can move to places like wet meadows um, or repairing areas where there's still, where there's water that's providing good green forbs and insects. So winter, as I said, is a really great season for sage grouse. Um, I love this picture right here. Um, that is not jackrabbit paths. That's sage grouse paths. Little sage grouse plows going through the snow to find some good sagebrush leaves to eat. So this is a picture um, that's really kind of um, emphasizing what I mean when I say sage grouse are a landscape level species. So this is um, GPS telemetry data on a group of sage grouse hens that were trapped up here on Lex in what's called our Sand Creek Desert. And you can see the scale right here, 26 miles across there. If you didn't know any better, you might say that I just put up um, some telemetry data from mule deer antelope, okay, from pronghorn antelope. But this is sage grouse. So these hens were trapped in here. Um, a couple hens took their broods up in here to spend the summer. A couple hens went over here for the summer. But this one is the most fascinating. This is actually two different hens. They came down here in winter to spend the winter. This is um, a lava flow right here on Craters of the Moon um, National uh, Park. It's not a park, National Monument. Um, so the hens, that, they were trapped in here. The one hen that went all the way down here, that's 62 miles. 
And that's kind of mind-boggling, um, really, when you think about a bird that's basically mostly, I mean, they're, I wouldn't say they're walking all the time, but they're walking or taking short flights to get there. And what time of year did that bird move? Um, Probably late October, early November. So, this basic summary, sage grouse needs sagebrush and large intact landscapes. So now that you know a little bit about the ecology of sage grouse, so what are the threats to sage grouse? So habitat loss and fragmentation, that's usually what we talk about when we talk about impacts to wildlife. But for sage grouse specifically, we're talking about wildfire. We all know that. We've talked about that several times. Uh, throughout the conference about the increase in wildfire in the West, um, invasive annual grasses. We had a presentation about Medusa head this morning, but that also includes cheatgrass. And um, those um, increase the fire cycle. So those invasive annual grasses are drying out quicker on the landscape, creating a lot of fuels, and just creates this endless cycle of fire, more cheatgrass, fire, more cheatgrass. Um, anthropogenic disturbance, sage grouse are very sensitive to human disturbance, and particularly they're sensitive to things on the landscape. So um, oil and gas development is a big problem in parts of the range, Wyoming, Colorado, um, that has very large impacts on sage grouse. Wells go up and sage grouse just avoid those, they avoid those areas, and at the same time reproduction is going down, that success is going down. Um, we have some, a couple of sage grouse that, um, with the GPS telemetry data on them, that they're just avoiding this cell tower in the middle of their home range. There's like 300 meters that they just don't even go that close to the cell tower. Um, and lack of regulatory mechanisms. Oops, sorry, I'm losing my thing. So lack of regulatory mechanisms is basically um, not having um, mechanisms to prevent those anthropogenic disturbances of going on the landscape. So let's go back to our birds in the Sand Creek Desert. So here's our, here's our population of birds, okay? That's several hens that were radio colored on black, so that's our breeding population. So unfortunately, we had a 100,000 acre wildfire this year in this red right here that impacted pretty much half of that population, okay? Um, so what else is going on in this landscape that could be affecting sage grouse? Um, so if we're talking about fire restoration within this population or for this population, we have mixed land ownership, and it's a checkerboard ownership of um, private BLM and state lands. There's also um, livestock uh, grazing within here, which is um, not so bad in and of itself, but we have cattle and sheep, which is actually kind of unique to a lot of our ranges in sage grouse, that we have both of those occurring in the same places at the same time. We have cheatgrass coming in on the southwest end of the fire. Before the fire happened, it was already moving in there. We have recreational impacts. This is the St. Anthony sand dunes. So it's very popular in the summer for off-road vehicle use um, and also very popular in the winter for snowmobiling. Um, and then, of course, we have agriculture. This agriculture has been here for decades, so the birds are probably pretty used to the agricultural impacts for now. And then I put a question mark right here. So we have these two hens that came down in here. But what if we put a wind farm right in the middle of this? What is going to happen um, to these birds, to this population of birds that is relying on this wintering area and being able to move to that wintering area? So really the question is, is how do you manage the cumulative impacts of multiple uses on a landscape level species like sage grouse? So, and of course the answer is, is partnerships. We've talked about that all throughout this conference. Um, that's really the only way we're going to get anything done or anything accomplished in these large landscapes. Um, and partnerships come in various shapes and sizes. So this is a picture um, of Governor Otter from Idaho who actually collected sagebrush seed after the 2007 Murphy Complex fire. Um, and we also have our sage grouse local working groups. We have 12 local working groups in Idaho that have been working since the early 2000s. And that's just a way for people to come together and talk about sage grouse, talk about issues, talk about habitat management, various um, things that are at impacting their local communities. Um, this is one of our local working group members who's a retired high school teacher that's out marking fences for sage grouse to minimize collisions um, of sage grouse with barbed wire fences. Um, 
Partnerships also happen in meeting rooms. We spend a lot of time in meetings. Um, and we also have range-wide partners. So this is a picture of a whole bunch of bi biologists and ecologists at the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency conference, Sage and Sharptail Grouse conference that happens every other year. Uh, this year we were in Billings, Montana, so we're just out there walking around looking at the landscape and talking about plants and sage grouse. 10 minutes, okay. So I'll talk uh, just real briefly about some exciting things that we have happening in Idaho specifically. Um, in FY16, which is the federal, excuse me, which is the state fiscal year, which is actually in 2015, um, the Idaho State Legislature actually approved general fund money for sage grouse and sage grouse habitat. Um, and that's pretty exciting that we're getting general fund money. That money went to the Idaho Governor's Office of Species Conservation in the Idaho Department of Lands. Um, and the purpose was really to implement the Governor's Sage Grouse Conservation Strategy, which was developed by a task force um, prior to the 2015 not warranted listing decision on sage grouse. Um, so when those organizations, when those two state agencies received that money, they immediately reached out to other entities and said, how can how can we best use this money? We don't want to exist in a vacuum and just put it to where we think it would be helpful, but how can we provide and uh, get the most benefit for sage grouse? So the sage grouse actions team was formed. Um, you probably don't know all of these acronyms. Um, we have the Idaho Department of Lands, the Office of Species Conservation, Idaho Fish and Game, the Idaho Soil and Water Conservation Commission, the Idaho State Department of Agriculture, the Nature Conservancy, um, the BLM, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, NRCS, and the Forest Service all participate on this team. And the interesting thing is we're not just sage grouse biologists. There's also representatives from the ag community, the livestock community, um, and fire. So when this group formed, we immediately had our goal of addressing the primary threats of fire and invasive species in Idaho. And we set priorities. So these are our priorities. Um, rangeland Fire Protection Associations, I don't know how many states have those now we have. Um, so basically what they are, they're groups of private landowners that form um, a cooperative to um, be first responders on fire ignitions in their area. They're trained the same as BLM wildland firefighters and they get equipment. So that was one of our first priorities was to make sure that they had the equipment they needed to do their jobs. Strategic fuel breaks was one of our other priorities, um, and I say strategic on, on purpose because we weren't just randomly funding fuel breaks projects, but what we wanted to do was we wanted to make, if, if a fuel breaks project was approved on BLM land, we wanted to make sure those fuel breaks were continuous by providing funding on private land or state land. Restoration and stewardship, again, restoration and stewardship projects going towards addressing those primary threats of wildfire and invasive annual grasses, and then research and innovation type projects we also wanted to consider for funding. So pretty much immediately after we received this funding um, and the group was formed, uh, the 2015 soda fire happened, and this was in southwest Idaho. It was a 228,000 um, acres of fire were impacted um, in Idaho and another 50,000 acres in Oregon, so two states. Um, there were 13,000 acres of Idaho Department of Lands lands, and 36,000 acres of private land. And those IDL lands um, are isolated sections, okay? So right after the fire, the BLM started a partner group. So again, kind of some of the same players that were in our partners, um, in our Sage Grouse Actions team um, are represented here. And we decided, first of all, that we wanted to do landscape restoration because we had um, multiple land ownerships. We wanted to restore the whole picture. We didn't want these isolated um, IDL sections to not be restored and have BLM restoration around them. Um, one reason we were able to be successful is we had a shared vision. And I think that that's important when groups get together that they have something like a shared vision or a shared goal that really helps um, everybody get behind that vision. Um, so our vision was that we wanted a resilient and resistant landscape that can adjust to normal disturbances without continued treatments or conversion to annual grasses. So our vision has nothing to do about a particular wildlife species. It has nothing about we want to get grass back out there for cows. 
it's a picture of what we want our landscape to look like when we're done with this restoration. Um, so we did a lot of, um, the BLM, Boise District, really embraced the idea of adaptive management, and they didn't want to do all their fire restoration in one year. So we had layered treatments where we might do something like an herbicide treatment one year, the next year come in and, and do drill seeding, and then evaluate how those projects went. And we also set um, thresholds for resumption of grazing. So that put some permittees off for longer than two years. And so in order for them to understand that and come to that agreement and come to that acceptance that they might be off their range for three years instead of the normal um, two years, um, they really also had to embrace that same vision. So that was really important that they understood that this is our bigger goal, is to have something better when you bring your cows back on. Um, and then the Sage Grouse Action Team was able to get behind um, this soda fire restoration and we helped contribute um, up to $400,000 um, for restoration on the state land parcels within that fire. And the Fish and Wildlife Service and the NRC also, also helped some of the private landowners. So one of the reasons we were able to be successful is we already had this MOU in place. I don't know if any other if states have something like this, but I'll just read it real quickly. Um, so the purpose, this MOU outlines communication, coordination, cooperation and implementation among the BLM, the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, and the Idaho Department of Lands for rehabilitation and restoration of sagebrush step rangelands. So what this MOU does, it creates um, not only, it, it creates basically a financial me mechanism for money to flow amongst the agencies. So we're able to do restoration um, across boundaries because, so for example, Fish and Game can um, buy the seed for restoration on the Idaho Department of Lands sections. Idaho Department of Lands might agree to, okay, well, we'll pay for um, the, um, the, the contractor, sorry, I couldn't think of the word, the contractor to do that restoration, but we're gonna use the BLM contractors, so the same contractors are gonna go across that boundary. So there's an easy, efficient mechanism for IDL to just give that money to BLM. So I'll just briefly mention this project. Um, our actions team has taken on many projects. This is one we're kind of proud of. Um, we've funded um, and helped provide uh, matching funds for a project that is looking at um, using weed suppressive bacteria to, um, as a tool in rangeland restoration. Basically, weed, suppre weed suppressive bacteria were documented on the Palouse Prairie in northern Idaho to um, decrease cheatgrass on the range. And the question was, is, is this really a tool that can be used to restore rangelands in the West? So we started um, a research project with the USGS, uh, specifically Dr. Matt Germino in the Boise uh, USGS office, to really look at whether or not this could possibly be a tool. Um, so we have three research sites um, spread throughout the uh, Snake River Plain outside of Boise. Um, those are on various land ownership, so we've had private land partners um, helping provide that land to, to do the research. Um, but it also developed into something bigger. So this, getting this project started, um, USGS now has um, sort of the, the leaders of a big collaborative amongst all various western states that have been using the weed suppressive bacteria to see um, if it could be an effective tool. So we're in early stages on that, but I just wanted to to show that because we're kind of excited about this project. So um, let's go back to our Sand Creek Desert. So again, we're talking about partnerships and we talked about um, sage grouse and how they're using the landscape in the Sand Creek Desert and the fact that there was a 100,000 acre wildfire in that area this year. Um, so this is the Sand Creek Desert and if you look at that, I think your first thought is, oh my gosh, that's a lot of sagebrush. Um, and that's been a constant war for decades between BLM, Idaho Fish and Game, and the private landowners because they want, that's too thick. They would like to remove this sagebrush, of course, to produce more, um, more grasses for their cows. There's nothing wrong with that argument. Um, Fish and Game has always came across for the attitude, we don't want to lose any more sagebrush for sage grouse. So it's been a constant argument. And in fact, just this past spring, 
we finally came together and sat down at the table um, and had a two-day meeting about, okay, let's listen to everybody's, um, what are your goals, what are your priorities, what do you see, what do you envision for this landscape, what do you need um, for this landscape. Um, we actually had David Dahlgren from Utah State University came out, up and talked to us because he's done a lot of brush management um, on the desert land and livestock uh, land here in Utah and had some really good insight about brush control. And with the group having these conversations, the group said, okay, brush control is fine, but we need to manage it across the landscape and we need to have a schedule basically if we're going to do it. Not everybody, let's not do it at once, but how are we going to plan it across the landscape to best benefit not only the producers, but sage grouse as well. So because we had already had those conversations, um, when the fire came, there weren't that many finger pointing. There weren't people yelling and screaming at each other, see, I told you, you should have been removing that brush because we wouldn't have had that fire. Because um, the trust had already been um, started to be built in that area. Um, and to me, one of the interesting things was um, that some of the private landowners have actually agreed to have sagebrush areolus seeded on their land after the fire. And these are some of the same private landowners that want to do brush control. So they can see both sides. They can see we need to get sagebrush out there as soon as we can, but we can also see that we need to maybe manage it so that it doesn't ultimately end up like this. So that's really um, the last, um, well, second to last slide I had. Um, but I guess I just wanted to end on, um, I have a little video here, hopefully it works. So I know not everybody are here because about sage grouse. They're about, really everyone's here about the landscape and maintaining the lands, the working lands that um, we all appreciate and love. And this video to me kind of just sums it up. It's because it's what we all want to see regardless of who we are, what agency we work for, what our background is. So hopefully it'll work. So the sound didn't come through very well, but um, not only do you hear the sage grouse booming, but you also hear meadowlarks in the background. And I think that's what we all want to see in the spring. That's all what we all want to see and hear in the spring um, is a beautiful sunrise and listen to the birds in the morning and have the potential to see sage grouse. So that is all I have for you today. Thank you. We have just a minute or two for questions. Do we have one or two? Um, so, before sage, so in 2010, sage grouse were listed as a candidate species for listing under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and one of the reasons that they um, decided that sage grouse were warranted for listing was lack of regulatory mechanisms. So that's basically the lack of our federal land management agencies, lack of their ability to limit things on the landscape, like wind farms and oil and gas development. So the BLM um, and the Forest Service have redone their land use plans to add some of that regulatory mechanisms back in so that hopefully we can at least minimize those impacts, um, either minimize them on the landscape or minimize the impacts. So that, that's basic, the basic part of that. Okay, thank you.